So the menu of today's talk is first, I would like to make you familiar with the notion of having of trapped calcium ions for quantum information processes and how we are using them. Then I would like to introduce you to the toolbox operations that we have at hand. Briefly introduce the characteristics of the Innsbruck quantum computer as we have it. And then just give you a few examples of computation simulations and even some measurements, some quantum measurements. If there's time enough, we can just uh, talk a little bit about uh, ideas how to scale this up. But uh, we'll see how this goes. And if you have questions, you're welcome to bug me any time with that. Of course, this work uh, was done mostly at the University of Innsbruck, but also in conjunction with the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Innsbruck. So let's get started. Our synthetic quantum matter, to be on cue with the subject here, are strings of trapped ions that you can see in the center of a pole trap. And we are shining lasers through them in order to prepare them for... Uh, yeah, the laser cooled them to, to become a string like that. We can see them with a fluorescence light here in the CCD camera. And this is a typical string of, say, 50 some ions. Uh, typical in the sense that we are working with that with every day. It's not the, 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 the very best that we ever observed. But that's so the workhorse that we have. Now, the ion is a calcium plus ion. And the qubit that we are uh, using is just implemented here on this metastable uh, state, the ground state, connecting this uh, transition at 729 nanometers. And we can detect it readily by shining in some light in on the dipole allowed transition right here. So in other words, when the system is in the ground state, then it just, just scatters light on this transition. So that's what we call the spin down or the logical one state. Or if it's up there projected to the D5 half state, it doesn't scatter light, so it's a logical zero or spin-up state. And this allows us to, to do the proverbial sigma c measurements or this quantum jump detection. Uh, we see really the jumps going back and forth between these things. And this is done by electron shelving, as we call it after Hans Demelt, with nearly 100% efficiency. So let's summarize. What we have at hand is then a two-level system, which sits in a harmonic trap. Of course, then we have to rewrite the Hamiltonian in such a way that we get many of these two level systems, which are just different here by the trap frequency in U. And then that gives rise to many resonant conditions for the laser that we apply. So for example, when we have, say, N phonons in the ground state and N phonons in the excited state, that would be a carrier transition. But we also can just tune the laser to this transition, which is what we call the red side pan. And then the system just scatters a lot of light and climbs down the ladder until it finally resides in the ground state of the vibration. And then we are left with exactly three transitions. This is the carrier transition with which we can manipulate the qubit or the sidebands which adds one phonon or the red sideband which just uh, subtracts one phonon. So in summary, the carrier is, allows us to manipulate the qubit that's for the internal superpositions and the sidebands allow us to manipulate the motion and the qubit that is we create spin motion entanglement. Now we are ready to do quantum information processing. We just have a bunch of toolbox operations. So we can resonantly manipulate the ions as indicated just before. But we can do that also simultaneously with the entire string by shining the line along the axis. And you can do so by tilting this uh, about the x, y axis about the angle theta with a very high fidelity in a short amount of time. We can do that, of course, also in a pointed way. We address individual beams to these ions right there. And usually we do that in an off resonant fashion, though also with a very high fidelity. The entangling operation that we are using is what we call a global Mermacernson entangling gate. That gate <coughs> essentially makes use of two photon transitions. So we shine in simultaneously red and blue sidebands to the system. <clears throat> and if you see here now the ladder of the harmonic oscillator in all of these states, then you see there's four different amplitudes to reach the, the excited states for both ions. So in other words, as for any good two photon transition, you know this is first order Doppler free, which really means uh, then you try to come up with the superposition of both the ground state and the excited state, which is a proverbial belt state, the entanglement. Then you just do that insensitive with respect to the motion. You can actually do that, that was figured out by Merman and Sorensen, and this is the uh, entangling gate operation that we are using, which is a global one because it just generates GHC states everywhere. And this is what we call with a two photon transition, like S squared, the S is for the spin notation, about the X, Y axis, and we also can vary the angle theta. That takes a little longer, and the fidelities are very high. These three operations already give you a universal gate set for arbitrary quantum computations. 
You have many more operations available, uh, but let me just give you the mathematical background for these. In the future, I will denote the operations just with these uh, block, color, colored blocks right here. Here are the unitary operations that pertain to these operations. So this is just the stock shift, the local stock shift. This is a collective stock shift applied to individual ions, uh, to all of these uh, individually, but uh, globally. They don't have uh, anything to do with each other. This is the collective local operations on resonance, for example, could be X, Y, or any superposition. And this is the Mirmer-Sernsen operation, which can be written as a spin-spin interaction here. <coughs> Keep that in mind, we'll come back to this notation a little later. We have many more operations, like hiding operations, so we can just hide one uh, of these qubit lines by transferring them to a different state from the computations that go otherwise on in the register. We have defacing operations for open system simulations. We have initializations and reset operations. We even can use other states of these atoms that we have here to realize a full quantum cache memory, and meaning that we can store the quantum information of a qubit somewhere in some excited states while we perform operations on the entire register. All of these things are available, and uh, they are underlying all of the stuff that we are doing. In other words, we break down a quantum computation or a simulation in a sequence of all of these gate operations. So we start from a superposition, end with a superposition, and the global uh, and collective operations right here, they allow you to run any algorithm. And of course, in the end, you have to retrieve classical information. It's just made a projective measurement. And for example, you find the realization of that one. And for some cases, you would have to make statistical measurements, repeat them 10, 15 times. But in any case, this is what you usually do. Then we are ready to do that. This is the, your usual laser laboratory that you all know. Right here, we have the trap, and the rest is lasers. And uh, then we can do all of these algorithms. I don't want to go through all of these things. They have been done in the lab. They have been done in other labs. I'll give you just a few examples. But of course, this is not, doesn't come in very handy. What you really want in the end, you want something more compact. And this is what we developed over the last years. So we have now a compact ion trap quantum computer demonstrator, which fits in two 19-inch tracks with all these details. You can read them. This was the work by Christian Marciniak and Ivan Pogorelov. And uh, they have managed to cram everything in this to 19 inch racks, as you can see here. This is work from the flagship initiative that we have carried out over the last, say, three and a half years. And this is now what remains from the trap module. And these are lasers, electronics, everything is in there. So what can we do with that? Of course, all of these things can be done that I've shown you before. In addition, we can do individual and local operations. That is, we can combine these things simultaneously by making resonant manipulations on one eye, while we do a non-resonant manipulation on the other one. Or we can even do local memories and entangling gate operations by shining uh, these two lasers, these two bichromatic laser beams simultaneously to two ions somewhere in this register. And uh, just to give you some control capabilities, the T1 time is about one second given by the excited state. T2 time approaches uh, pretty much 500 milliseconds, so we are there where we want to be. We routinely work between 20 and 50 ions, and even right now we are gearing up towards 100 ions. We have demonstrated the 24 qubit GHC state, and we support all kind of languages that you have in order to do these things. And um, there's an automatic tune-up. We have a single qubit control, of course, single setting memory up to 20 uh, qubits with full connectivity. If you want to do more, you have to do a little more work. But the tune-up, and that keep in mind, to 99% fidelity with 20 qubits and more, happens in half a minute. So this is the booting of the quantum computer. I'll show you later some commercial equipment that we have the time to do that. We can really run this with up to 50 ions and routinely so. Now, this is just to give you an idea. We can individually address all of these ions. Of course, it's necessary. But you can actually see these are the Gaussian beams. They may talk to the neighboring things. And if you just look here at the crosstalk matrix, you're not supposed to read these numbers. They are all small numbers right here. But on the average, the next nearest neighbor crosstalk is about 1.2%. And the average crosstalk is less than 0.2% that we have with the beam pointing uh, capability that we have. Just to tune a little bit in, this is what we get in detail when we just go into the matrix. And this is, uh, as we say, 
correctable because this is a coherent error because we can correct for that. And in fact, what we are using, we're using what we call addressing error correction. I'm grateful for uh, Nikolai that he introduced the composite pulses. This is a standard routine technique. So instead of one pulse, we use three pulses so that the neighboring one gets automatically corrected for the crosstalk. So in other words, the error rate that we get for the non-resonant part is about 10 to minus 8, which is really negligible at the level of 10 to minus 6 that we need in order to get, say, to, for, to a error correction that we really want in the future. <clears throat> then, what about the 2-qubit performance? When we just automatically tune it up, say, in a 12-qubit register, for example, the fidelity reaches 99% uh, in about 30 seconds. And uh, so we just, this is one of the automatic tunes. Uh, then this works reasonably well. If you really want a bit more, 99.5, 99.6, you have to tweak it by hand. You need still a postdoc, but uh, usually this works uh, pretty well and we are working on further automation. Just to give you the crosstalk matrix right here, the crosstalk matrix is two qubits it can be decomposed in two different things. There's a so-called phase shift on the neighboring ion because there's, of course, an off-resonant action to that one. But of course, since we are talking with murmur sorensen gates with two different frequencies, there could also be a dephasing on neighboring ions. And so we distinguish between these two things. For the single qubit phase shifts on spectator ions, these are the ions that are sitting right next to it or somewhere, but are not directly addressed. This is correctable. We can do that because that's, as we said before, can be used by addressing error correction. This one is not yet correctable. And this is uh, the culprit that we have at this time. The dephasing of the spectator ions needs to be down to at least 10 to minus 4 or better than 10 to minus 4. The average on all of that is at this time 6.3 times 10 to minus 4. So this is where the current work is dedicated to improve these things because we really need the threshold which is below 10 to minus 4 in order to get finally then to error corrected systems. That's it. This is just another automatic tune-up curve because we routinely measure in the system GHC states because they are the most sensitive with respect to noise and perturbations. And uh, this just shows you a 24 uh, qubit GHC state. This is about 50% right here. This is one of the automatic tunes. So we have routinely quantum registers with more than 20 entangled qubits. In fact, we are routinely operating now with up to 50. That's it. Let me just give you a few examples of what we have <coughs> been doing so far. I'll just uh, uh, summarize these under simulation approaches. If you have a problem at hand that you cannot really or don't want to uh, compute on a classical computer, you go to a simulator. It could be a lattice, atoms, could be ions, could be superconducting. There's essentially three different versions. One version is what we call an analog simulation, which requires a match between the engineerable interactions and the model. And then you just apply the interactions, and after a certain amount of time, you stop there and watch the evolution. There's the digital way of doing this. You replace this with a digitized version, really meaning it's just a sequence of unitary operations. As I said before, it's just a compiled version of all the gate operations that just uh, com comprise uh, the entire algorithm that you want to run, and then you stop it. This, of course, is what you eventually want, because you can do error correction right here. You can't do error correction there. But this is something that is very complicated, because it requires very many gate operations. There's something in between. That's what we call a hybrid simulation. Here the problem, like your Hamiltonian, resides in the classical computer. The classical computer finds some parameters with which it taps into a quantum register, here in this case provided by the analog quantum simulator. Instead of doing the calculation in the simulator, you just measure one value, for example, the, excitation, the expectation value right here, feed it back to the computer, which compares whether that uh, agrees with what the computer actually calculated beforehand when it just tapped into the Hilbert space. If it doesn't, then it just goes around until it iterates so long until it finds the real value. Well, this is uh, what we call a hybrid or a variational simulation. Let me just give you a few examples. On the analog simulation, this is a, your easing model that you have. The group of Chris von Rohr already has shown a long time ago that you can start uh, see the, the, the crossover from paramagnetic to paramagnetic crossover. This is a phase transition right here. So you see nail ordering and things like that. There's a nice review recent by Chris Monroe's group where he covers most of these simulations. We have done the same thing, but we are just using here uh, usually terms which are much bigger at this point, then uh, this can be rewritten as the XY model. So we use all kinds of Hamiltonians. You can study transport phenomena. You can see how entanglement emerges. And lots of these things, this is a tunable uh, system, and uh, you can just do many things. Here, transport the phenomena again. 
So he starts, uh, you can use this order, which you apply, for example, by non-resonant beams to the individually addressed parts. And of course, you actually add some noise. So here is the, is tr the transport that you see in a ballistic way. Here, the transport is inhibited by Anderson localization because you have a lot of disorder right here. And then if you just add the noise, then you get a diffusive enhanced transport. And if you add, your, if you, if you add too much noise, then, of course, the transport gets, of course, hindered by uh, Zeno um, effects and things like that. There's even uh, hydrodynamic behavior that you can see. Lots of these things have been done over the last five years in, uh, the, the, in the groups. Just to give you an idea about quantum simulations in a computational way, here you break down everything in the sequence of unitary operations. But very often, when you have a Hamiltonian like that, these parts do not commute with each other. Then you can resort to what we call the Trotter Suzuki approximation, so you can approximately uh, approximate that Hamiltonian by making slices of the individual parts right here, time slices which you repeat then in sequences n times, and that approximates the evolution as indicated right here. Uh, this has been done many times, and uh, here's a, an analog approach that we have again the, 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 the easing uh, Hamiltonian that we saw before. Here's just the digital quantum simulation. You see the uh, uh, variation right here, but you see also the more gates you apply, these are the experimental points, this is what you expect in theory, you run out of steam. And the reason for that is that here, of course, the fidelities are not high enough. This is some older work. Nowadays, we could do that better. And this is some more recent work, for example, where we just implemented the one-dimensional lattice uh, gauge theory, it's a, it's a Schwinger model in this case. Here we can apply more than 200 gate operations to see the evolution right here, which then just mimics the pair creation, the, the particle-antiparticle pair creation uh, described by the Schwinger model. And lots of these things can be done. Currently we are working on two-dimensional Schwinger models in the same way. And here, uh, last but not least, as an application, as an example, uh, variational quantum simulations. Again, as I said before, before, the problem resides in the classical computer, and you just tap into a Hilbert space and let it go. And uh, again, we just use the Schwinger model right here. And if you do that, then you can just make measurements and to then slowly approach the expectation value that you just measure there, which is then uh, approximating then the ground state of the Schwinger model, which is indicated right here. But these, paths, these points right here are there in order to avoid that you are get, uh, they get stuck on a local minimum. But more importantly, if you do that in such a way, you can also implement the variances right here. And if you measure the variances and they are getting closer to zero, then you know immediately I have an eigenstate. So this is where you can self-verify that the system actually works as indicated. And of course, you can do quantum chemistry calculations. They have been done mostly in the, my group and also in Chris, Chris Monroe's group. You find many applications. That said, let me just conclude with one more way of measuring these things, of, of, uh, of, of adding this, this scheme to a quantum measurement. The theory work was done by Peter Zoller's group, and the experimental work was done in my group by Christian Masiniak and Thomas Feldka. What is the idea? One of the proverbial precision measurement is just to measure the precise frequency between, say, for a clock, for example. And this would be, in our case, the transition between S and D. And you usually take Ramsey spectroscopy. We saw that yesterday already. And then we just uh, make another pi over 2 pulse right here. And then we get the phase evolution. This is a typical picture that you get from such a measurement. Or when you close in, you see just right here, the center line. Uh, and uh, so these measurements were done, of course, routinely in our lab. And we have also used them for frequency standards. This is the most recent one, the PhD thesis of Milena Guevara Berch. And you see this then goes down to a few times 10 to minus 16. And lasers that can be compared go down almost to 10 to minus 17. So that's available in the lab. And uh, these measurements are routinely now done. The question is, can we improve these measurements? We heard already yesterday from one of the talks that we could use possibly, uh, if you measure ensembles, we can use spin squeezing, squeezing for example. The question is, can we generalize Ramsey spectroscopy in this way? This is the usual way to do it. But now we have, say, many ions. Can we just make uh, use of that? And here the idea was, OK, we generalize this pi over 2 pulse by just an encoding unitary, and the second one as a decoding unitary. 
Then we measure the total excitation, we define a cost function, so what is it what we want to optimize. Then we define, say, the operations that we need for these unitaries right here, let the system go, and then we let the system iterate until we find an optimum value. Of course, what we are looking for, we look, want to estimate the interferometer phase from the measurement record. We have a Bayesian estimate. and. Um, I have another five minutes. Is that okay? Thank you. Then uh, the, the prior phase, that the phase distribution. And of course, we minimize now the variance and optimize the performance for real parameters. Let's just look at this. When you just prepare this with a classical coherent spin state, that is just the pi over 2 pulse that I just mentioned. Then you get for the interferometer the sine curve when you just have as a second pulse a phase shift of 90 degrees. This is precisely where you want to stabilize your interferometer. If you go for a cost function, then you see, okay, this is just quantum shot noise, pro projection noise in our case, and this is the shot noise distribution, and you just look for the mean squared error right here. <coughs> this uh, is the center, just because there's shot noise there, it just increases a bit, and this is the prior that we have in the system. Now let's uh, say, okay, we make a spin squeeze state. Remember, a spin squeeze state can be made with a spin-spin interaction, that is precisely the milner sorensen interaction, that's the one axis twisting operation you heard about yesterday. So when we do that, then you see, okay, that's only a slightly different behavior right here, but we see the noise gets better, as we expect from a spin squeeze state. There we use, of course, as the uh, decoding sequence, only another pi over two pulse. But now we can just do better. We can say, okay, let's just start with a coherent uh, spin state as an input, as a pi over two pulse as an input, but we want now a tailored measurement. We just make the measurement according to the uh, system as a at hand. Can we do better? First thing that we can do better is the so-called catching range, which is, which is used to stabilize the interferometer. But the error is only slightly better than the original one. It's worse than for the spin squeeze one. But if you go both for tailored inputs and measurements, then you see you get a wide improvement for the interferometer. <clears throat> and in fact, to summarize these things, you are very close to the optimum quantum behavior, the quantum limit that you actually can get in such a measurement. You see here, this is already a gain for 16 ions of about 5 to 6 dB. And if you go to 1,000 ions, you can imagine this goes much better. You can actually do this also with ion clouds or with atom clouds. Even this easing interaction is, in, is doing this the job here to create spin squeezing. With this, I'm nearly at the end. <clears throat> we have, of course, a number of strategies to, uh, to scale this up. We need more qubits, better drops, you need better control. We are working on all of these systems. What I personally find important is predictability. You need to be able to, to predict the, component, uh, the system performance from component performance, which is not easy to come by and definitely not available, for example, when you work on an IBM computer. Uh, then scaling down ha means we have to miniaturize everything. You saw already we cramped everything into a 19-inch rack, and we have further to do this. Something that needs to be considered here is the scaling out. The scaling out really means we need interconnectivity, interfaces, and distributivity. This has very little has been done here, but we are working on that as well, and we can talk about the question addition. Here, I don't have the time to go into that, so let me just... Can you push the button on the... Right left corner, there's the arrow. Push the button, please. I don't have access to the computer right here. If you just move the mouse there and just click the right arrow. And... Gentlemen, can you do that, please? Perfect, thank you. Then the dream and the vision of that is that we have local logical qubits which are predicted by error correction and then finally in, are interconnected by dipole-type interaction and then operate in a fault-tolerant way. I don't, didn't have the time to go to the fault-tolerance operation, but that has been done in the lab as well. Then, of course, we need more qubits. We can go to 100 and more, we are gearing up to 1,000. We have much developments right here. Most importantly, however, is to keep the qubit alive by this error correction implementation. This is what we are currently doing, and then the rest should be easy. <clears throat> this is a big team that did the work over the last years, which could not have been done with very many uh, theorists that helped us doing that. Here are the names. And this is where we are, right next to the airport. This is the quantum computer, which is now made by AQT, Alpine Quantum Technologies. And if you want to buy one, contact Thomas Mons, he's the CEO. He's happy to sell you one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. We have time for a few questions. Okay, so if you talk about quantum computing with ions, currently among qubits, there are several 
candidates like Z1 qubits, optical qubits, hyperfine qubits, and different uh, ion species. What is the best choice to work with? What is the best candidate for quantum here computing? Here could actually quote yeah. my good. Here could possibly quote my good friend Dave Vineland. Choose your poison and live with it. Uh, <laughs> and the point simply is, mm -hmm. all have some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, of course, we can also encode things in Zeeman states, and we do so because they live longer. The optical decoherence is actually uh, getting to us when we want into uh, the error correction scheme. We need, I can go into all the details. So, error correction might be a little easier if you have a longer lived qubits. But on the other hand, the long lifetimes and the, stu uh, the stuff is not going to help you. You want to speed up the calculations. So, what you really want, you want to have speedy op operations and speedy error correction. No matter what you do, you have to live with that. I, we can go into all the details here of all the disadvantages. Thank I'm you. happy to do that. Hey, Rainer, you mentioned that by changing the strength of the coupling, you can go from the Ising formulation to the XY formulation. Yes, can, can, you can you say how? The, the point is the following. The Ising interaction is just the spin-spin interaction plus the magnetic field. And if you remember the toolbox that I gave you, spin-spin interaction is a Milmer-Zerns -Spin interaction. And plus the detuning, that the magnetic field is mimicked by a stark shift. Now the point is, if you really go to stark shifts that are very large, then uh, the interaction with the B field gets smaller, uh, so, so, sorry, gets bigger, and then you can rearrange things. And we just make it um, in, in, in that way, or we can go to the other limit where we have the JIJs very big. And, uh, then you can rewrite the X, this into an XY form. This is two, two lines. I can write this down. And uh, we, we, uh, Chris Monroe uh, has investigated one case. We investigate the other one. There's a large variety. And we, the, the next thing that's tunable is the interaction range. This is we have a power law, and that is I think it, it is even more important because now you can just change all these things and see how the, the entanglement appears. So that, that's very flexible. Right now we are we can even mimic a Heisenberg model and show spin squeezing in a Heisenberg model. Excuse me, you mentioned about this uh, single axis uh, twisting. I, I missed uh, how can it be produced for in your system as, as yes. x square or <clears throat> z square? You remember the, the, the one axis twisting operation is just uh, the interaction strength times a j squared term. The j squared term, that's the, uh, the, the, the sum of the, 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 of the angular momentum of the, the joint spins. What we have is the milmer sorensen interaction. Remember, the milmer sorensen interaction is a spin-spin interaction. This is why I, I abbreviated that as an S squared in my case. So this is our notation. This is spin sum. That's exactly the same term. We have a spin, uh, total spin of the entire chain, sum it and square it. So that's the same interaction. So it's the all-to-all -all connectivity uh, in the ions when we make gate operations. So the milmer sorensen interaction is a one-axis twisting operation. It's identical. So let's thank the presenter once again.